Welcome everyone to a webinar series on the long-term energy scenarios for the clean energy transition. My name is Pablo Carvajal from the Arena Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. This webinar series is organized as one of the activities under a clean energy ministerial campaign on the long-term energy scenario. And it is aimed at promoting wider adoption and improved use of long-term energy scenarios in guiding long-term transition to clean energy. The campaign addresses three interrelated themes. The first one is about the use of scenarios and the political process guiding towards clean energy transition. The second theme is about improving scenarios and modeling tools to reflect emerging factors relevant to the transition. And the third and last theme is approaches to build scenario building capability in the government sector. Today we have uh, two speakers. We have Rejma Franci from the UAE Ministry of Energy and Industry. She will be speaking about using scenarios and improving scenarios. Followed by Alec Waterhouse uh, from the UK Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, who will be presenting about using scenarios. Each speaker will have 20 minutes, 15 minutes of presentation and five minutes for Q&A. The webinar will be recorded and shared through our Arena's webpage. And before we begin, I would like to briefly introduce you to how to operate the Webinar 500 user interface. All of you, the attendees, are currently muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. If you have a question, please send your questions to, to us using the question feature on the webinar panel. Questions can be only reviewed by us and not shared with the audience. We will be monitoring the questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our panelists at the end. Due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered by the end of the session. If you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing via phone. You can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel. You may also download the presentation slides in PDF in the handout section. If your technical difficulties remain unresolved, you may write to us through the question section. We will try to help you. Uh, thank you very much. We welcome then our first speaker, uh, Resma Franci. Um, hello, Pablo, and thank you very much um, for the introduction. So, um, so I expect that my presentation is up there, and I'm going to start off with uh, taking you through some of the experiences uh, from the UAE perspective. Um, as we embarked on the first um, long-term energy strategy setting on a national level. Uh, the time horizon we looked at was 2050 and it was launched in the year 2017. Today I will go through the use of the scenarios and the modeling uh, which we had undertaken for setting this uh, clean energy target. So the national energy strategy um, had two key elements. One was on the clean energy uh, target of 50% uh, and complemented by the 40% on the demand side reduction from the business as usual. If you're on page two of the um, presentation, we have the team here uh, standing alongside our uh, prime minister who launched this uh, strategy. In the context of the UAE, clean energy includes renewables as well as uh, nuclear energy. Can you switch the slides, please? So the launching of the energy strategy was in Jan 2017, like I mentioned earlier, and we had paid uh, significant, significant attention to the elements of communicating our strategy. Um, and on that regard, we co-created with um, the Prime Minister's office what we call the Future Lab, and a game to simulate the targets and receive feedback from the stakeholders. The game was designed on the elements of the strategy, which includes the targets on clean energy as well as energy efficiency. The approach provided an opportunity to bring together the various players in the sector around the same table and hear their perspectives on uh, the scenarios we had created and the targets in those scenarios and challenge them to some extent. In this particular picture, we have uh, the Prime Minister of the UAE, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, overseeing the simulation of the future. And this tool uh, provided an illustration of, um, of outcomes on uh, transportation, buildings, the different sectors in, in the energy um, space um, for the different scenarios uh, which were created. We can move to the next slide. 
So designing the Future Lab, um, the Future Lab was created uh, for stakeholder interaction. It was um, a table designed to host the policymakers, the voices of the private sector, and public opinion, which are all elements of a successful policy cycle. We hosted six such tables to cover all the key entities in the country, as we have uh, very strong local governments who need to accept the targets and work towards implementing the same. The game was um, oriented towards testing the targets and identifying the challenges of achieving this uh, target. So the players were all provided with challenge cards, including some blank ones where they could put in their point of view if we have not already covered them to highlight uh, the issues which need to be solved to arrive at the targets. The outcome uh, report of this exercise uh, is an interesting array of uh, focus areas to work on towards achieving the targets. Some of the challenges that the utilities brought forward was uh, on cybersecurity and storage, um, the opportunities and challenges of EVs. Um, we also saw a lot of um, interaction between the public voice and private sector as they um, put their weight behind some challenges, um, supported uh, uh, the voices um, uh, raised on the table. We move to the next slide. Here we come to the objective um, of the national energy strategy. So in the overview of the strategy work, the primary objectives um, to be met uh, through the selected scenario includes um, energy security, affordability, and sustainability, um, while increasing the productivity of the UA economy, as is the case amongst uh, various nations, uh, and as is a as is highlighted by the World Energy Council through their work on, on the Trilemma Index. Now moving to the next slide, the development process itself. So the process um, was very long and we had a very collaborative approach towards it. It involved the creation of a team representing all the key utilities and the local governments, um, our main stakeholders. As the UAE has a federal structure with policies and regulations to be set at the local level, uh, it was very important to have the strong collaboration and validation uh, by our stakeholders uh, for the results to be accepted. Um, next slide. So the modeling tools used. So for this um, exercise, the underlying principles of the model uh, were based on the polls uh, model developed by Anadeja. Uh, there are elements uh, such as the energy water nexus, for example, which is very specific to the UAE's national context, and this needed to be incorporated. Um, the use of cogeneration for water gen for, for water was included and aligned to the long-term strategy on the water sector. Uh, similarly, the record low prices uh, for solar technologies um, at that point in time was uh, very unique uh, to the UAE and we wanted to incorporate that into our decision making process, uh, which would give a true representation of the country's national circumstance. The outputs were then developed into an indexing approach to compare and rank the scenarios to support the decision making process because ultimately we needed our um, leadership to decide um, on the on the targets. So the, the polls model um, is, um, is, is run uh, uh, based on key drivers of, of the fuel prices, the technologies. Um, we do have a plethora of outputs which come out and we we'll discuss how we have used them in the indexing approach as we go further. If you switch to the next slide, it's on the sectors investigated. So the key demand sectors which were covered um, includes the industry, transport, and services sector. Uh, the industry sector in the UAE includes the oil and gas, uh, of course, um, aluminum, uh, iron and steel, as well as the cement uh, as major entities. The transport sector included uh, mainly focuses on road transport because that is um, the biggest in scale on our uh, domestic context. Um, in terms of the services sector, we have primarily included residential as um, residential buildings. Um, 
on the supply side for the electricity and water generation, we have covered um, the entire mix. Um, it includes clean coal, uh, which was already part of the future mix of the Emirate of Dubai uh, when we um, embarked on this journey. The selection criteria was based on the cost, availability of the resource, uh, and maturity of the technology. In addition to the long-term target setting, we conducted the, long, uh, the load curve analysis uh, to ensure that the selected mix is able to meet the power demand during the time when the solar generation is unavailable. We also looked at the renewable energy potential in the country um, based on RE map mapping um, and the IRENA's renewable energy map, uh, which was published at that time for the UAE. We switch to the next slide. So the demand um, sector uh, was based on econometric approach and the demand is driven based on the prices of the fuel, the economic growth and improvements in technology or sector specific um, efficiency improvements. Uh, this uh, feature was used to estimate the potential of energy efficiency um, per sector uh, other than, rather than just uh, the total demand reduction. Moving on to the next slide. Here we have the uh, multiple scenarios that we developed and uh, investigated and ranked uh, amongst each other. Uh, the motivations towards renewable energy and, and, and the energy efficiency varied from low to high, including a specific scenario on um, very high motivation called climate force. Um, this was uh, testing the impact on carbon value on the energy system. Uh, the demand side reduction varied from a minimum of 20% to a maximum of 26. And the key drivers, of course, were the prices, the GDP, and uh, the growth uh, and, and the declared uh, projects at that time on uh, clean energy, and uh, as well as uh, nuclear. Moving on. So the indexing scenario, like I mentioned earlier, we needed, uh, we were tasked with uh, providing a ranking approach to discuss the different scenarios um, and across the main themes, the main objectives uh, that were set. Um, and here we have the index which we have co-created with our stakeholders and provided weightages across them. They definitely feature energy security and reliability, affordability, sustainability, and happiness. So at the time of uh, decision making, uh, the UAE government had um, uh, appointed the Minister of Happiness, and happiness was to be accounted for in all policy making. And therefore, we've included happiness and linked it to the difference in the cost of production from 2013 which can impact the paying customers, as well as the emissions, which can um, result in air pollution as important aspects on, on happiness. Across all the scenarios, the 50 at 50 scenario, which was the winning scenario, um, uh, stood resilient across all uh, across the sensitivity analysis that we conducted on, on prices and on GDP. Um, this approach, um, of indexing, which provided uh, a, a number that brought together multiple um, elements and um, multiple outcomes uh, from the different scenarios was very uh, useful from the decision-making perspective and provided um, guidance to the leadership on, um, on, on, the, on the scenario, on the winning scenario, the one that they would uh, uh, support. Moving on to the last slide, uh, this is the representation of all the numbers that came out of this 50 at 50 scenario. Uh, this includes 50% of clean and 50% of fossil fuel based generation capacity by 2050. Uh, the scenario is in comparison to the BAU and is estimated at reducing CO2 emissions from the power and water sector up to 70%. Uh, the 50% of the clean energy includes 44% of renewables, uh, primarily solar energy, and 6% from the nuclear power. The fossil fuel based generation includes 12% of clean coal and 38% of gas, um, which is currently our primary fuel for electricity and water generation. So that brings me to the end of the slides that I've prepared, um, and I'm happy to take on any questions.
Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we do have some um, questions that we want to pass on to you. The first question we have is, um, where do you get or how do you elaborate your long-term GDP assumptions? It is known that GDP is, what is the driver of demand and it impacts the results of models in terms of capacity expansion. So um, yeah, the question is, where do you get uh, your long-term GDP assumptions? So in the UAE, we have the Federal Statistics uh, and Competitiveness Authority, um, who is uh, coordinating the activities around the GDP forecast. So we liaison with them uh, to, to, to provide us with the, with the most reliable forecast, uh, simply because it is a fundamental driver in econometric models such as ours. Yes, thank you very much uh, for that answer. We have another question. Um, the UAE has many emirates. Do they have their own plans? How are they coordinated? Um, yes, so uh, this is where uh, we have emphasized on the very strong stakeholder engagement and collaborative work. Um, we do work with the emirates. They provide us their input and uh, they do benchmark with our uh, targets, and the target is set um, in a way that they are able to understand how, how far they need to go um, and, uh, and benchmark against uh, our numbers. And they also provide regular feedback into their expansion plans so that we have an understanding if we're on track or not. Uh, so yes, the Emirates do have a very uh, strong presence. And they are the ones who are in charge of the implementation work, uh, but we work in collaboration with them uh, in, in achieving these targets and setting these targets. Rajma, thank you very much for your question. Another question, um, have you considered the use of other models? Where does the actual modeling really happen? Uh, yes, indeed, we did uh, look at the available options at that time and, and given the objectives, resource availability and the timeline that we needed to, to meet. And that was uh, where the model that we selected um, came through as the right option. But as we go further, we are, um, the re the, this is a long-term strategy. It requires uh, periodic reviews. And as we move towards periodic reviews, we are also periodically uh, searching um, for uh, better models which represent the, the current situation or can provide better granularity. So we do do that kind of analysis before every review. As a matter of fact, we are in that moment right now. Uh, in terms of where the modeling capacity exists, um, in the initial round, since it was a very high level target setting along in a, in a collaborative process, uh, we hosted, uh, we were trained internally on, on the model and uh, many of the modifications were done by our internal team, um, as well as the analysis and the supporting structures of load curve analysis or the indexing um, process, all this was done in-house. But going further, we are also debating um, on the in-person and outsourcing of models. Uh, and therefore, we are really looking forward to the uh, LTS seminar in, in Berlin. To, to understand what is the discussion around the world on this topic. Rashmi, just to follow up on that answer, is that uh, you received um, capacity building in the poles model or in the leap model that was on the slides? I'm sorry, we had the poles model on the slides. Uh, in the poles, it was the underlying principles were based on poles. I'm not sure where to get the leap. So it's, it's a poles model, which which is uh, on the slides. And we have received training in LEAP as well. But when we compared and contrasted, and like I said, depending on the resources and the time requirement, uh, we chose poles was, uh, was the winning option at that time. Thank you very much. Uh, we have um, one, more, one last question. It's uh, regarding the future lab idea. Uh, it's very interesting. Could you describe how the game is structured? How were the reactions from participants? And finally, uh, where can we get the reports of the game you mentioned? 
Um, so in terms of how the game was structured, uh, it was uh, essentially um, taking the elements of the strategy. So we said we want to talk about the renew the clean energy targets, the energy efficiency, uh, the impact on, uh, on on the emissions, um, and uh, these were the main elements that were incorporated. Uh, we provided the targets, uh, the four scenarios that were mentioned. All of those scenarios had representing uh, targets and challenge cards uh, involved. Uh, we received a very positive reaction from the stakeholders because uh, we had very high level um, decision makers sitting around that table. Um, the picture that you see um, has, uh, of course, the Prime Minister himself who had an overview uh, we had uh, the MD of the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority. We had Ministry of Climate Change on the same table, the regulators. Uh, so we are very high level decision makers who got very um, hands on and they were very forthcoming and the um, approach allowed and enabled them to um, really put their thoughts out there. And uh, we also saw a very interesting interaction. So we had given out little uh, coins or weights that they needed to put on each of the challenges to showcase uh, how much they weigh uh, or the importance of that challenge. Um, we also saw an interaction between the players where they said, where they lobbied and said, you need to put your, your cards or your coins onto my challenge because it, it is really important or it is going to be a big a roadblock. And we saw that interaction happen. Uh, the report is, um, is within uh, within uh, the Prime Minister's office and, and the Ministry's archives, uh, which is not uh, to be disclosed, disclosed publicly, but we can definitely put in touch with the um, consultant who had come on board to help us with this exercise uh, and the Prime Minister's office themselves who had selected them. Um, Rajma, we wanted to thank you very much for that uh, good presentation of the, how the UAE is, is, is building their national energy strategy towards 2050. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to give now way to Alec Waterhouse, who will be presenting uh, the case of the UK from the view of the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Alec, please. Good morning, everybody. Um, Pablo, have you got the slide? <clears throat> The slide's available now to, to uh, people. Okay, so I'm starting on the uh, the first slide that's just an introduction. My name's Alec Waterhouse. I head up the central modelling team within this department, Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Um, so if we move to the second slide, um, just to give you some background to the way that the UK manages uh, its transition from a, uh, to a low carbon economy. Um, long time ago we signed the international agreements and we're participating in the Kyoto Protocol, the UNFCCC. Um, part of that uh, action was in the UK, we have something called the Climate Change Act, uh, which uh, requires us to set uh, what's known as carbon budgets, uh, which are legislated amounts of carbon that the UK is allowed to emit over a, over a set of periods. Those are published um, and we track our progress towards them. Uh, it allows us to look into the future and uh, try to understand uh, from two points of view. One is the what the demand for energy in the UK is going to be, and then uh, we forecast and try and understand how that energy is going to be provided, and I'll talk some more about that, and what government policies are going to do uh, in the way to uh, change the way that that energy is provided from uh, being relatively high carbon intensity to low carbon intensity. Uh, currently, our target is to, uh, for by 2050, to have reached a point where we're emitting carbon at 80% of the levels that we were in 1990, and the trajectory is uh, set out in that way. Um, at the moment, we've gone out to the fifth carbon budget, which takes us out to 2032. Um, so if you move on to the uh, second, uh, the third slide, um, what we do, uh, talking about this, is we uh, publish our projections every year, and they're available on the internet, and there are um, uh, there are references there that will tell you how those, uh, what they are. Um, inside that, it tells you um, what we think our uh, primary energy demand is going to be, what we think our final energy demand is going to be what we think our greenhouse gas emissions are going to be, 
and what the effect of government policy is going to be on those things. And that allows us internally to uh, look at where uh, we need to develop uh, the approach within the UK government to decarbonising because what we're really interested in is the difference between what the carbon budgets are in the future and what we expect to be emitting. So if we're emitting more than uh, we think, uh, if we project to emit more than we've got allowed for in the carbon budget, uh, then we'll have to think about then we have to think about the uh, ways that government policy can be brought forward or developed to close that gap. And the most recent um, uh, part of that um, was our clean growth strategy, which again is published. Now in the UK, uh, the way that, that those carbon budgets are set uh, is that we have a uh, an independent body called the Committee on Climate Change who set who recommend those budgets to the Majesty's government, and we in our department respond to those to either accept or reject them. So that's a little bit about the background. So how do we uh, work out what our emissions are going to be? Um, well, we have a uh, historic uh, set of emissions that come from a statistical time series that's called the Greenhouse Gas Inventory. Um, and then we project uh, energy from combustion and other related greenhouse gas emissions within a model that we call the energy and emissions, or the, they're in the energy and emissions projections. Um, some of those emissions are calculated outside of our modeling and then incorporated into the uh, projections. So the Department for Energy, for, uh, sorry, for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs provide projections for uh, emissions that aren't caused by human activity, so things to do with land use uh, and land use change. And then uh, the other things to do with um, non-energy, non-CO2 projections, such as commercial refrigeration, they're provided by uh, another team within our organization. So just move on to slide five. Um, so this is uh, how we calculate our emissions. Um, on the slide, I hope you can see the colors. Um, there are three models that we use. Firstly, uh, is something called the energy demand model. Uh, that's in box one, it's outlined in red. Uh, and inside that model is a suite of econometric projections uh, that take various sectors of our economy uh, and apply uh, and apply econometric projections to those sectors uh, to project forward what their demand for energy will be in their final energy demand. Um, if you move around the cycle, we have. Uh, Electricity is a particularly interesting uh, part of our energy supply um, and we use something called the dynamic dispatch model which calculates and works out how electricity would be supplied in future under the, under the, for that particular energy demand. Um, it looks at uh, particular uh, given those uh, given prices that come out of our energy demand model and given uh, the understanding of how how uh, power stations uh, react to that, we will either build or replace existing power stations with newer, cleaner power stations um, uh, or with renewable uh, renewable sources. Um, and from running that model, we get a new understanding of what we think the price uh, that the wholesale price of electricity that will be faced in the market. And that moves us on to the third part of the model where we uh, then calculate the price that will be of electricity that will be faced by the consumers, and that's done in something that's in bill for. So once we've we've calculated that, we put that back into the energy demand model uh, and redo the cycle, and we keep on cycling that uh, usually several iterations until the uh, electricity demand that's coming from our energy demand model. Uh, a given price matches the price that we would expect to come from the dispatch model. So that's how the cycling works. And once we've got that, we can then calculate how much, uh, what the emissions are likely to be. Um, the should say that the econometric model takes in a whole series of primary inputs. So we have uh, forecasts of what the economy is going to be doing, and we use um, uh, forecasts from other government departments, such as the, um, the, the Office of Government Response of 
I'm sorry, I've forgotten the exact name, but they provide us, they're providing us with uh, forecasts of uh, our Department of Transport looks at the forecast for transport demand um, and internally we look at the demand for energy in the home and industry. One of the things that we do know is that demand is temperature as well as price sensitive uh, and we have long range projections of what we believe the uh, weather conditions are going to be, particularly temperature. Uh, we understand, we also look at what policy is going to do, what government policy is going to do to demand using, we also use our forecasts for fuel and carbon prices and what the historic emissions were. So if we put all that together, we are able to produce the set of reports that I referred to earlier that are called our updated energy and emissions projections. Um, so I'm just repeating myself here, but on slide six, uh, you can see where the inputs come from. So fossil fuel prices, again, that's another set of models. Carbon prices is another set of models. Exchange rates, it's the Office of Budget Responsibility. Uh, they give us a uh, view site of exchange rates because a lot of uh, the uh, prices are sensitive to uh, dollar prices rather than uh, sterling. Um, and then economic growth, again, comes from the Office of Budget Responsibility. So we rely, I think the point of this slide is saying that we're relying on a large number of data and forecasts from outside of our uh, of our team to able, enable us to produce those models. So if we move on to slide seven, uh, just to do, elaborate a little more about the energy demand uh, model, that's the, the, the uh, first model that we use. It's got approximately two and a half thousand econometric equations. It's pre predominantly, uses, it uses regression analysis to look forward, project forward uh, historical data. Um, and we take projections from all sorts of other places I've referred to. Temperature is corrected in the equations uh, where our regression and analysis shows that to be useful. Um, and uh, as I've said, we take um, inputs from uh, a variety of places such as uh, trying to understand what our industrial growth is going to be and what our demand for transport is going to be. Each year, uh, we use a series of backcasts uh, to test how well that model works and then to revise the results of the uh, model that are performing least well. Uh, and then we update and revise the parameters within those equations. And occasionally uh, we engage third parties such as academics um, to update the equations, but mostly we do that in-house. Just thought a bit about how we include uh, policies and measures. So uh, when we're forecasting demand, we take the historical energy demand by fuel from the digest of K energy and then we add in what we believe the effect of policy was to get us a understanding of what the demand would have been without those policies and then we project forward that counterfactual demand using our econometric models and then we subtract back future policy savings and that allows us to uh, be able to make estimates of the overall effect of government policy. Um, one of the things we're re very concerned with is uncertainty in our models uh, and that we provide confidence intervals around our forecasts using Monte Carlo simulation of some of the input variables. And we have to take care, as you would know, that uh, to deal with some of the variables are very strongly correlated one on one another, so we have to take care of that. Um, and in the long term, we use scenario analysis to look at the effect of uh, particular changes or radical changes that aren't easily captured uh, by varying econometric projections. Um, so that's looking forward in time. And you can see here in, on slide 10, um, a suite of uh, projected demand results. These come from our uh, emissions projections for 2015. They're all published and they're all available online. So if I move forward to slide 11, um, so what we've done now is taken you through how we think about uh, demand and uh, understanding the economy in the future up to the end of the carbon budgets. And then looking forward beyond that, we use a different approach to understanding how we transition from uh, a, how we transfer our economy to a low carbon economy. Um, and the approach that we use is to use a version of times. I uh, hope everybody's familiar with that. That's a least cost optimization model. 
it's been configured for the UK energy system. It runs to 2060, um, and we regularly update that uh, with it's very, very data hungry, uh, and it needs to know all sorts of things about costs, uh, final energy demand, um, and it makes some very, very strong assumptions about the future. Um, given so it allows you to understand how to supply energy to the UK at least cost um, provided uh, we assume that all energy demand must be that met it must be met at the lowest cost cost and that technology constraints such as the rate at which we can build power stations or the rate at which we can add renewable energy system to the to the uh, to the system are, are, are fixed um, and the final one is that there's perfect knowledge of the future energy system. So there's some very, very strong assumptions that are made there. Um, it doesn't take into account. So the sorts of thing, if I move on to slide 12, uh, the sorts of things that we could do with UK Times are to try and answer the following questions. So we can understand, try and understand the least cost part way to configure the UK energy system. That assumes you've got perfect foresight and that assumes that any changes that we could make um, are feasible within the political context that we've got. So there's no politics involved in this particular set of modeling. And uh, we know from practice that uh, these costs are very, very are almost impossible to reach because there is a sweet whole set of other um, socioeconomic considerations that aren't contained in the Times model. So it allows us to understand how energy vectors change over time. It's almost certain that the, the actual pathway will not be the one that we, is the least cost of, for the reasons I've just discussed. And then finally, uh, Times can tell us what the technologies are important for reaching 2050 under a range of scenarios. So we use uh, scenarios such as high growth, high electrification, uh, thinking about using hydrogen, uh, and try and understand which technologies feature in each one of those scenarios, which tells us which are the important technologies. It also tells us in rough terms the order of the actions to decarbonize the economy. So what should we do first? Uh, and then we can also assess the consistency with thinking about how to develop key technologies uh, for decarbonizing. And we're also interested in the sensitivity of the least cost path to changes in assumptions. So what doesn't it do well? very difficult because uh, of the approach. It's got perfect foresight and it discounts uh, prices into the future. It always defers, the model's algorithm always defers action to the last possible minute. So it always seeks to delay action for as long as possible subject to constraints. So it really uh, doesn't give us much view, a very good view of exact the exact trajectory. Um, it, it can also, it's also difficult to tell what the exact costs are. So the way that we use the model is to look at the relative differences between costs between different scenarios. So if we start with our counterfactual, how much more or less is it than the counterfactual rather than working it out in exact uh, money terms. Learning rates are very difficult to incorporate in the uh, modeling because uh, there is no feedback loop. And one of the features of a least cost optimization model is that it actually will opt for the cheapest technology. If we, uh, if it knows, if the model knows and it's got perfect foresight that a technology will come down in price, um, then it will wait until that price has come down to something that it was, thinks is acceptable and then use that, which kind of breaks the rule that in order to get learning uh, and reduce costs, you need to have deployed before that point. Um, other things uh, we don't understand uh, using this model are specific regional impacts and the costs that might be borne that are non-system costs. So how much might it cost us to persuade the UK to adopt um, solid wall insulation, for example? Finally, uh, last couple of slides now. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time thinking about assuring our models, making sure that they're validated and verified. Um, so slide 14 and 15 uh, show you how uh, we assure our models. We have a senior analyst who agrees that the assurance processes have been applied correctly and they're responsible for uh, making sure that those outputs, the outputs of the model have been validated and verified. Uh, and then we have uh, a requirement that all of our models are separately and separately assured by a different team than the ones who actually created the model. Again, 
uh, we use something called the Aqua Book, which is uh, av available online, which shows you the UK's government's approach to quality assurance, um, which sets out principles. And then if we move to slide 15, that shows you how we do it in our, our organization. Each model that we produce has what's known as a quality assurance log that has five categories and we score how well our models are assured against those categories and we get a percentage score from those and that allows us to track how well a model is assured um, and how that assurance state is improving over time. So the last slide now, if I'm on slide 16, um, what have we learnt about over time? Um, firstly, is to keep our models as simple as possible. They might sound really complicated, um, but if we're ever going to start, we try and keep them as simple as possible, start with the minimum and then build out from there. Uh, it's very, very difficult to understand uh, highly complex uh, systems without, from, if you build them as complex from scratch. Um, we need to make sure that the inputs to our models are aligned between the models. So we, for example, with GDP growth, one of the things that we need to make sure is that each of our modeling, models in our suite of models actually all use the same inputs. Otherwise, we've built in difference right at the beginning. We have to build in time to quality assure and time to iterate those models. I think your colleague, the colleague speaking from the UAE uh, was again um, demonstrating the importance of uh, engaging and interacting with policymakers so that they can understand what the consequences of decisions are in the future. And that speaks to the last point, which is spending time working with our customers to understand what their needs are and to help them understand what the outputs from our models are. And that's all. Uh, that's my last slide just says at the end. And that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Alec. Um, we we um, we will have some questions that are very interesting that are coming in. Um, it seems that like your presentation made made, made a big splash. Um, we have some questions that are more towards the structure and the process of the modeling, and then other ones that are more modeling modeling um, interest. Um, the first one is: um, Can you outline some specific benefits of having modeling capability? in-house uh, specific benefits um, if we work in-house we have the ability to be able to react much more quickly to ad hoc requests um, and to be able to drill down into those models so that we genuinely understand what's going on um, I have a worry about uh, I don't know if uh, what's known as black box models where you procure something that provides you with an answer without actually knowing what's going on inside. Um, so when I say we uh, develop models in-house, particularly with times, we have collaboration with a group of academics that help us to produce that. Likewise, with the uh, models that we use for our energy demand, again, as you say, we often procure things from outside, but we build them corporately inside our own organization so that we control and understand the direction of travel for those models. We understand the inputs uh, and we understand deeply how those models work, which helps us to explain and interact with our customers. Thank you very much. Um, regarding the quality assurance process, um, it seems to focus on expert review. The question is, do you engage beyond the experts and, and reach civil society or general public in this process of quality assurance? Well, OK, in terms of uh, the quality assurance process, what we're interested in, and you have to be careful about what you're quality assuring here, uh, what we're interested in is the technical approach, whether or not the models uh, meets its requirements for its scope and specifications and whether or not it's, uh, form, it, whether the form of the model actually does what's required in the scope and specifications and doesn't require any, uh, doesn't make any mistakes um, along the way. Um, in terms of validation and verification, uh, we often speak with our stakeholders to, uh, we speak with our stakeholders to ensure that what the models actually do is what they asked us, asked for in the first place. Um, I've got no, I, I don't, we don't publish our models uh, routinely, um, so it's difficult to for third parties to do that, to assess those. However, 
on occasions with some of our large models, we engage a third party contractor to uh, to carry out a review of that model. Thank you very much, Alec. Uh, a couple more questions that are coming in. Um, this one is related to the um, modeling you presented to project demand. So we know that one of the drawbacks from regression analysis is that it cannot capture disruptive events or the introduction of new technologies since it depends on the yeah. past. So the question is how to overcome this limitation when, with, your pro with your approach to modeling demand and how are sector coupling options, this is electrification of end use sectors taking into account in this modeling framework? That's two questions. I'll answer the first one first and then ask you to repeat the second one, if I may. Um, when we're aware of that, uh, the econometric projections are basically rolling the past forward into the future, um, we have done some work, not very much, um, looking at the effect of disruption um, on those models. Um, and we did a small project last year or was it the year before last but anyway um what we were interested in doing was looking at some scenarios um where we were trying to understand what disruption what disruption might happen in the future um so a good example might be something like onshoring manufacturing or the rise of 3d printers something like that um and we used a uh, a futures workshop to arrive at what those uh, future scenarios might look like. Once we'd actually understood that, we then uh, looked at how that might affect demand and or the, uh, the demand for energy and or the energy the energy vectors that are going to be used inside our mathematical model. And then we made some adjustments to the parameters within that model that were not based on the uh, understanding of the historical time series, but our understanding of what uh, that parameter might be in the future if that scenario had, un uh, had come forward. So what that allowed us to do was within our um, econometric projections, we could take those scenarios and place those into alter the parameters in the model to say, well, if that was the future, and this affected the parameters in the model this way, you then get a single point that shows you what the effect of that particular scenario might be in the future. And they tended to be they tend to be a long way outside of the Monte Carlo uh, simulation, which looks at small perturbations in the underlying parameters. So the second question. Paolo, I couldn't, I, I've got a very yes. short memory. What was the second part of the question? Yeah, so the second question is uh, how are sector coupling options, for example, the electrification of end use, uh, taking into account in your modeling framework? Um, so if we're talking about uh, the electrification of end use appliances, um, depending on, if we're talking about the short term, uh, or the medium term within our energy demand models, uh, we capture those in terms of how government policy might uh, be developed. So for example, we might have a policy that uh, uh, brings forward um, district heating, for example, um, and then uh, our colleagues who develop that policy, we have a series of economists and mathematicians and modelers who do that, will provide us with a, an assessment of what the effect is on the demand for energy uh, of, for each vector as a result of that policy. If we, uh, so that incorporates that into our medium term projections. If we're looking into the future uh, using times, uh, the uh, times has a suite of uh, technologies that can be applied that will either reduce the demand for energy, change the demand for energy into something that's less carbon intensive, or um, yeah, or change. The, and what the, the way that Times works, it will select from that suite of options those that it thinks are most important. So within, say, the domestic sector, uh, the electrification of uh, heating. Uh, might be one of is one of the technology options that are available to um, two times. Uh, if it chooses to implement those, the model then increases its requirement for electricity on the network, and as a result, we would need to build more power stations 
And as a result, it will then have to make some choices about what sort of power stations they're going to be, whether or not they're wind, solar or uh, conventional um, thermal power stations using carbon intensive fuels. So uh, the, just to say that in our model, the coupling effects are uh, taken uh, into account through the way that the uh, network of transformations happens throughout the suite, throughout the times model. So in that same line, now that you've mentioned uh, how, how, how times uh, participates in this process, we have a question um, of the things you presented in slide five, which is this structure with the econometric analysis, the power dispatch model, and uh, how, how does that articulate with the long-term uh, analysis you do with times? How do these three models in the red, um, in the red circle connect with UK Times? How do they communicate in, uh, with each other? Well, we don't run all of those with UK Times at the same time. That is, that's just too computationally intensive for us. Uh, what we do is we take the parameters from those models. So for our energy demand, uh, we're using those uh, to provide us uh, the energy demand model to provide us with projections into the future of how we believe uh, final energy demand for um, particular services is going to grow in relation to our economy, um, population, etc. Uh, the way that time, we inside the dynamic dispatch model is a deep understanding of the cost of providing electricity at uh, with different types of technology um, and an understanding of how systems balance uh, to provide uh, uh, the amount of uh, capacity that's required um, and we use that model to help us understand and develop parameters in time times uh, isn't spatially or temporarily very very far it's not very finely divided so our dynamic dispatch model can uh, help us understand how much capacity we will need to build into the system in order to be able to cope with peaks and troughs in uh, electricity demand that aren't captured in a times model. So we uh, use that to um, parameterize the times model to say how much extra capacity is required over and above that to satisfy an av the uh, average demand or the long run demands that are put into the model. And then in terms of prices and bills, well, that's not really captured inside the model. What it's trying to do is minimize the cost of the overall system. So it's actually just uh, trying to work. It doesn't look at profits or prices or things like that. It's trying to just minimize the overall cost. Thank you very much, Alec. We just have three last questions, which are really, really simple from the modeling perspective. <laughs> one, that's very interesting. Very interesting. When we get a lot of questions, it's it's because the presentation is interesting. Um, the first question is, uh, which I think anything was simple. <laughs> Which IPCC methodology do you use during the calculation? Tier two, that's the first question. The second question is, um, you mentioned that temperature was important for your analysis of uh, residential demand. Are you considering the change, climate change in those, those numbers for estimating temperature projections? And thirdly is, you mentioned that you carried out sensitivity analysis. Could you talk about which, what, what inputs are the, mo are the ones that are causing uh, the biggest changes in the modeling results for the UK? Okay. Um, the first one I don't know off the top of my head. I'll have to go and look it up. Uh, if you remind me, I'll I'll I'll, um, uh, I'll I'll respond back to you later on that one. The second one was sorry. What was the second question about temperature? Yes, you uh, mentioned. Well, our, 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 our organisation um, doesn't produce long. We use the meteorology Met Office, the Meteorology Office of UK. Uh, who have a very large simulation of uh, the global climate um, and they project forward um, the uh, number of the, t the temperatures in the average temperatures in winter and summer and it uh, certainly since I've been working I've been working here five years now and uh, in my time working here it's been the first time that we we use a concept called winter and summer degree days which is the number of days uh, uh, multiplied by the number of degrees that above or below a particular threshold uh, and our projections are now uh, using a increasing number of winter degree days i.e. that our projections from the Met Office are saying that our winters are going to get warmer and our summers are going to get hotter 
uh, and that uh, is being built into the model. It affects demand for space heating in winter primarily and in summer for air conditioning and refrigeration. And then what was the last question, Pamela? Yes, the last question is you mentioned that you had done some sensitivity analysis and we have questions uh, regarding have you identified what are the key inputs that, that, are, that make the model switch the results? For example, the carbon price. Um, what are the carbon price assumptions? So what we do, uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what they are, but the GDP obviously makes a big difference. Um, uh, prices for fossil fuels make a big difference, I believe. Um, and the way that we do that is by examining the parameters in our econometric model uh, and looking for those uh, parameters that have got uh, the biggest um, effect on the final energy demand. Um, and then uh, obtaining, we use um, uh, Microsoft Excel um, at risk uh, add-in that looks at uh, the shape of those particular um, distributions of uncertainty and then applies those to our models. Thank you very much, um, Alec, for your, for, your, for your answers and for the presentation, the details. And with that, we want to close. Um, we want to thank our, our speakers, both Alec and Rejma, for their time and their presentations. And we'd like to remind you that our next uh, session on this webinar series on the use and improvement and capacity building for long-term energy scenarios for the clean energy transition will be on March 7, uh, 2019. So keep tuned in to Irina's webinar series. Uh, thank you very much.